Good morning. I'm going to try that again because I know some of you people had your coffee and tea this morning. So good morning, everyone. Good morning. All right. It's so good to hear your voices this morning. My name is uh, Frederick Brown. I'm the Deputy Executive Director with Learning Forward, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this Thought Leader Lecture. So this is a fun one. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Many of you who are here are here because you're interested in how do we think about the whole child. And this framework that will be discussed this morning is something that I think will give you a lot of food for thought. I'm just here to say a few things before the session rolls out. One is in the conference app, underneath, underneath the section around this particular session is the full document that will be discussed. So it's in the handout section. So I just want to alert you to that fact so that you can go down and download it there, but you'll also find out throughout the session where you can go and download it from the various websites. So that's one. And two, I wanted to thank the Wallace Foundation for the sponsoring some of the work that you're about to hear this morning. And I'm gonna ask Rochelle Herring from the Wallace Foundation to come and offer remarks. Good morning, everyone. As many of you know, the Wallace Foundation supports research to fill in important gaps in our collective knowledge of what works in education. I had this up here for me. Let me get it. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thus far, much of our work has been in the area of the development of school leaders. In 2013, the foundation was thinking about the potential of social emotional learning to transform the lives of disadvantaged youth. While we were already working with school districts and community partners to boost student achievement both in and out of school, we all came to an understanding that it takes much more than strong math and reading skills to be, success be successful in life. Research was increasingly demonstrating that student success also depends on a range of attributes that society values. Behaviors like persistence and conscientiousness, attitudes like self-confidence and openness to new ideas, as well as attitudes and abilities like self-control and social skills. However, we were all keenly aware of what we did not know and what the field did not know, including which factors matter most as children develop and how these factors can be developed. That's why we commissioned a new research synthesis from the University of Chicago's Consortium on School Research. It was a tall order, and we think they've done a remarkable job. Foundations for Young Adult Success, a developmental framework, was released this June, and it brings together decades of research from many disciplines. It emphasizes points that are malleable, that gives us all as educators, leaders, and parents the best chance for positive intervention. It also highlights which traits come into prominence at which age, making it easier for us to understand the social and emotional needs of our students at different stages of development. I hope this research sparks deeper conversation about the role of social and emotional learning in student success. Now, it is my honor to introduce Jenny Nagaoka, Director of the University of Chicago's Consortium on School Research. So thank you, Rochelle, and thank all of you for coming here this morning. Um, I also want to give a big thanks to the Wallace Foundation for really giving us the opportunity to do this project because I think it's really rare in education that we have the opportunity to take a step back and really think about what it is that we're trying to accomplish. Think about the big picture about what it is that we really want for our kids. How can we be more effective in doing it? And, you know, and how we can get there. So as Rochelle mentioned, um, we released a report um, in June. Um, and so this is, we, in this we put together a framework where we're really trying to understand the different factors that matter for young adult success. Um, the idea behind this framework is not so much of to suddenly 
invent new knowledge because what we did is we looked around, we, we um, did a lit review and we talked to a lot of different people. Um, but it's really to help all of us understand the nature of our work more effectively, to see the interconnections between what we do on a day-to-day -day basis and what other people are doing to give us a common language to really think about what we're trying to accomplish and how we can, act, how we can get there. Um, this has also been an interesting project for me because um, I've been doing education research for about 18 years. Um, I've been thinking a lot more about this realm of social emotional learning, non-cognitive factors for about the past five. Um, and one of the things that I really came to realize through this work is that in many ways our lens about what we're doing in the world of education is actually quite limited. You know, we think about what happens to kids primarily when they're within our buildings. But what happens to them outside the school has a tremendous influence. There's also a huge amount of knowledge out there. Um, about three years ago um, in 2012, we released a report looking at non-cognitive factors and the role that they play inside of the classroom. I think one of the most exciting things about that is that it really started to expose me to what is known in the after-school world, and I realized that in education, we tend to focus on the cognitive side of things, right? We think a lot about knowledge and skills. We are just starting to really think about the role of social-emotional learning, about the a whole more holistic view about what we're trying to accomplish. Um, this is something that has been happening for a long time in the after-school world, and we haven't been doing nearly enough to learn from that world. Um, so that was so this project has been an opportunity to do that. Um, so within this framework, um, we're really trying to think about how to support um, the development of young people across multiple settings. So what's happened to them in schools, what's happening to them in after school, and what's happening to them um, in, the fam in their family setting and in the community. Um, I'm, gonna, this is, I'm, only, I'm gonna be talking about the organization of the report, but this is also how I'm gonna be organizing my talk. Um, a lot of what we wanted to think about was what are the skills, attitudes, and behaviors that contribute to a successful transition into young adulthood? Um, we also wanted to think about how adults can promote the positive development of these, um, of these factors um, through something that we call developmental experiences. So we think a lot about the fact that the way we learn and the way we develop is not just through someone telling us what happens, but through the experiences that we have and having the opportunities to reflect upon those experiences. And I'll be talking about that a lot more in, de in detail and later on um, in my talk. Um, finally, we take a developmental perspective. So we think a lot about when these key windows are and what's happening with kids at, at different points in time in their development around these key skills, knowledge, and behaviors. So one of the biggest questions, um, and where we started this from, um, was this idea of what do we actually mean by success? Um, I think one of the things about um, where I started from with this work was I actually had a pretty flip answer, and I think a lot of this happens a lot um, in education. Like most of my work has been around the transition from high school into college. So when, whenever somebody asked me about what does it mean um, for success, what are we trying to do, I always talked about the role of college and career readiness and success. And I felt like I was fairly confident that that was really what mattered. Um, but then, as a part of this project, we also spent a lot of time talking to practitioners to really understand how they were conceptualizing success. And when they started, when we started talking to them, they had, a, they had a common beginning. I mean, they also started off with saying how important college was, how they wanted to make sure um, that their that their students would be employed at the end of all of it. But when you really started to talk to them and where they really started being much more passionate about their work and why they were doing it, they talked more, much more about the ambitions of what they wanted their kids to look like as young adults. The fact that they wanted them to ha be happy and healthy and to have strong relationships with their families, to have a real place in the community, that there's a much, much more into what they're trying to do and so what we started to think, you know, if this is how adults are conceptualizing success, most likely this is also how kids are thinking about success. And so we really want to be working with students and engaging in this idea of what they want to become and who they are. We need to not just be telling them it's about college, it's about you, you need, you're going to need a job, so you need to do this, but also seeing our role as helping them figure out 
who they are going to become as they move into adulthood. And so we had this much more um, encompassing view of what success is. It does make it a lot muddier from a researcher perspective. I like things that are measurable, but unfortunately, that's not the way the real world plays out, and we don't want to be limiting ourselves just to something simply because it is much more easily measured. Um, so I mentioned this before, but you know, one of the things that we did was we really took an interdisciplinary approach to this. You know, part of it is this idea of how do we best support young people into adulthood is something that I think humankind has been thinking about th throughout time, right? And so, you know, th so um, there's a lot of, a of a knowledge that has been acquired over time across many, many disciplines. You know, and I think the other thing that we know is that, you know, we we did a we did a th we did a lit review, which is spanning um, areas that I was you know fairly novice to, like neuroscience. Um, we looked into we've been looking into psychology for quite a while. You know, sociology, philosophy, all these different ways of really thinking about what it means um, to be successful and what contributes to that. Um, the other thing that we understood through this project is the fact that we really can't be limiting ourselves to what's been written down. Um, there is a tremendous amount of knowledge out there which is in the practice world, which I think in many ways we don't tap into. You know, we wait for research projects to tell us, we were, or at least in my world, we wait for journal articles, but it's really through these conversations um, with practitioners and policymakers and people who are thinking about these problems through the course of the work that we really started to understand what it means to be successful, how do we, what does this look like, and how do we support kids to get there. Um, so kind of from the title, this is kind of clear, but we took a whole child perspective. And I think um, a lot of times, you know, there's sort of, you know, this is about social emotional development, it's about the more traditional realm of knowledge and skills, it's thinking about the vast range of ways that kids develop. But I think one of the ways that we are really emphasizing in our, in, um, in the, our work that is actually relevant to the narrative that's going on today is bringing together this idea that there's cognitive and non-cognitive, academic and non-academic. You know, as we were going through the literature and as we really started talking to people and understanding what this looks like, um, we began to realize that these divisions are just not helpful. Um, you know, a lot of the terms that we think of as being non-cognitive are actually tremendously cognitive, or they have a cognitive component. It is not as if sometimes we're thinking and sometimes we just do things. These are really interrelated, and and to separate them out doesn't actually help us because you know, what we often call non-cognitive factors have a tremendous role in learning and, and thus really do have this, um, this role to play in how we're thinking about the development of kids. Um, another big part of this is that we took a developmental approach to this. Um, so we thought about five different stages, um, early childhood, middle child, early adolescence, middle adolescence, adolescence and young adulthood. Um, because we think this is one of, the, one of the things that we really need to be paying attention to as we're helping kids develop, is not just what do they need, but what are the key windows for when they're developing? How can we be, most, uh, how can we be more effective in how we tap into where kids are developmentally so we can, um, we can help them be more effective learners? Um, I also mentioned this earlier, but we thought a lot about the multiple um, settings that kids inhabit. Again, we're trying to take a child's perspective on this. You know, they are, kids are learning all the time, no matter where they are. They're developing no matter where they are. And so if we really need to be thinking about the role that each of these places um, take in um, how kids are growing and developing, um, and how, what we can learn from each other, how we can actually start to share a common language about what we're trying to accomplish. Um, so we spent a lot of time thinking about the role of the different settings that kids live in. Um, finally, and in many ways I think most importantly, is this idea of thinking about the role of context versus an individual. You know, I think one of the things that I've seen a lot in the way that non-cognitive factors, social emotional factors are quite often conceptualized, that these are things that we're really trying to develop in kids that what makes kids successful is sort of a combination of talent, um, these things that we've helped develop in them, and how hard they're working. And we really talk about this um, from what's going on with kids. And it's not to say that that's not true, um, but it's really important to really think about the larger context that kids are inhabiting. 
how this really shapes um, what they need, where they're coming from, what sort of skills they really need to, in order to be successful. Um, I think a lot of times when we think about, um, so I'm from Chicago, so I think a lot about the high poverty, the kids who are living in high poverty neighbors in Chicago, um, like Englewood, for example. And we tend to think that you know these are kids who, they clearly have had a really different experience than kids who are coming from a wealthier suburb um, in the North Shore of Chicago. Um, and you know, so what we need to help them become successful is really different. But on the other hand, I think we also need to acknowledge that you know, kids are coming from different places. Um, when kids grow up, they really they learn how to navigate their own environments. They start, you know, if you grew up in Englewood, you know what sort of skills, you understand you know, what's going on in your neighborhood. There's a certain culture around that, that really kids gain a certain type of competency and skills to understand that. It's not always the kind of thing that is helpful for them when they move into the school setting, but it is something where they have learned um, how to be and that they have a set of skills that can be tapped into. Um, so part of it is understanding how we can translate that. Um, it's also just realizing that the sort of supports and the experiences that kids have um, are different. Um, kids who grow up from wealthier backgrounds tend to be exposed to a much broader range of the world um, than kids growing up in poverty because they just tend not to leave their neighborhoods or have the opportunities to really you know, visit other countries or to go, down, um, go downtown and visit museums. So there's a lot of things that are a part of um, the experiences that we sort of see as being important for being successful with, but are not necessarily a part of the day-to-day -day experiences um, for some kids. Um, so moving over to how we're thinking about what our model is, um, we thought about you know, what are the foundations for young adult success. And we formulated this idea about what this looks like within an individual um, in kind of two bigger, two kind of rings, if you will, um, on our model. So there's the outer um, orange ring where we really are thinking, what are the outer components? What does this look like um, for kids to be young adult success? How do all the different things that they have come together? How do we start to envision what success is knowing that um, success is not a one-size-fits-all thing, but really starts to sort of say um, that allows um, the flexibility for kids to be reaching their ambitions in different ways. Um, so those, we have that on the outer ring, and so those are um, three key factors of agency, integrated identity, and competencies. Um, on the inside are what we call our foundational components. So we see these be as being um, the components that really underlie what goes on. These are much more discrete ideas of what kids need in order to be successful. And I'll be going into in details in each of these in just a moment. Um, so with our three key factors of agency, companies, and integrated identity, you know, a lot of what we thought of um, when we were talking to people not um, about what, they, what, what young adult success meant to them was not just what they can do, but how are they going about doing it? What are the things that make kids be able to be successful? Um, and in the course of our conversations, it really, we sort of distilled this into three big ideas of agency, integrated identity, and competencies. Um, so the first part, uh, first um, component um, is agency. And so agency is this idea that, you know, young, young adults, in order to be successful, really need to see life as having choices and options where they actually are taking an, an active role in what their life is going to look like. Um, in many ways, I see this as being somewhat different than I think another term that's out there quite a bit, like grit and tenacity in terms of what kids need, where I think a lot of times we think about grit and tenacity as being about getting through things, right? You know, if you're given homework, you need to figure out how to make sure that that homework gets done. Um, as opposed to agency, which I think makes me in some ways a little bit more uncomfortable if I were a teacher, is this idea that it's not just about getting through homework, but actually interrogating it, saying, you know, is this really, like, understanding why you're doing it, saying that, you know, this is something that is supposed to help me learn, and thinking, how is this helping me learn? And maybe sometimes saying, 
you know, I don't understand this, I don't know how this is helping me, or saying, I'm struggling with this, I need to talk to somebody to help me get through this, but really sort of seeing it not just as something that is you're doing on your own to try to accomplish, but understanding the larger picture of what's out there around it. And I think this becomes particularly more important um, for young people who are growing up um, in poverty because they're, they're growing up in situations where the sense of what the world is is such that a lot of things feel like they're imposed on them. And I think that happens a lot in schools as well where we set up rules and sort of see it as these are things that we want our kids to do. Um, when kids grow up in um, upper middle class households, a lot of times there's an encouragement for people to question and be independent and think on their own. Um, that we don't necessarily have across the board uh, with a whole spectrum of different types of schools. I think agency is about is this idea of pushing ourselves to really think about this. And when kids grow up to become adults, um, we don't want them just to endure. We don't want them just to show up and do things. We really want them to be engaged and to see their life's choices as being options, that they actually ha are able to exert some control over what this is going to look like. Um, the foundation for agency is this idea of integrated identity. Um, it's tremendously important if you're, you can't just go through life seeing yourself as, with, as having different choices unless you also have a clear sense of who you are. Um, understanding the interconnectedness between who, like where you grow up, who you want to become, and where you are currently. It's also seeing this interconnection between um, between different types of roles. We all know that you know, who we are um, at work is different than who we are with our kids or with our friends. And this is something that young people also need to learn how to navigate, that just because the norms are different in different places, this doesn't preclude you from being the same person. You have a, you have a center and you understand how you adapt who you are to different circumstances. And this is not necessarily things that are completely incompatible, or it's part of growing up is to understand how do you reconcile these different types of things. Um, of course, this is something I think that we all struggle with, so it's not like there's a finite point of where we all figure this stuff out. Um, and then finally, um, it's this idea of competencies. So it's not just enough to um, know who you are, to have a sense of where you're going and feeling some control over this. This also rests on having um, the requisite competencies for different types of tasks that allow you to be effective in different types of roles or to be taking on different types of tasks that you have within those roles or to really know what it, or have the abilities to actually take on what you need in order to meet your goals. Um, okay, so underneath um, these three big ideas of the key factors um, are four foundational components. Um, the idea behind these um, foundational components is that they both contribute to the development of these factors. So a lot of ways the key factors are how these different foundational components come together. But each individually also plays a key role um, in contributing to success. Um, we also feel that all of these matter um, in different ways and you can't, it's not that you can just work on one. If you just work on mindsets, everything will be good. Um, being successful doesn't, isn't just about um, having the right mindsets, it's also about having the right sort of knowledge and skills, it's about being able to self-regulate in different circumstances, it's also about um, knowing what's important to you and understanding the values that you hold. Um, the other part of this is that each of these we see as being malleable, these are things that change over time, um, and also really help promote development. Um, so a lot of, you know, we don't want to be saying that something is important, especially in the education work. We can't actually change it because it doesn't really help guide us for what we're trying to do. Um, so we spend a lot of time thinking about these different things in terms of what, how we can, or what, whether or not they can be changed. Um, later on I'll be talking about how we think we can help change them. Um, finally, um, each of these components we see as being expressed in different spheres. So some of these are about what ha is happening within an individual, sometimes is our social and ha what's happening in relationship to others. And some of these about, are about how an individual interacts with the larger world. And I'll be um, going through each of those um, as I talk about each um, key factor. Um, so what are these um, foundational components that I've been talking about? 
Um, the first one um, that we think about is self-regulation. So self-regulation is this idea that you can manage your emotions, um, your behavior, um, and be able to um, regulate it in different circumstances. So some of this has to do with what you're doing within. Some of this is how you're actually managing your social, how you're interacting with others. And sometimes um, this is about how you're interacting with the larger world. Um, we also um, talk about the role of mindsets. Um, in our 2012 report on non-cognitive factors, um, we think about four key mindsets that are really key um, for learning in the classroom. Um, we think about the role of self-efficacy, the role of having a growth mindset, the role of belonging, and the role of um, relevance. Um, and so those are things that we see as being key to learning in the classroom specifically, although larger um, young adult success, um, there's a lot of mindsets that are out there. We investigate a lot of them. We didn't feel like there was a definitive set of mindsets that matter in all circumstances. Um, so we don't have a list of them. But in terms of what goes on in the classroom, we think about you know, whether or not kids are able to engage in um, learning has a lot to do with whether or not they believe they can do that. Do they have a sense of self-efficacy? Do they believe that working hard will pay off and having a growth mindset? Um, do they actually see the importance of what they're doing? Does it actually have value to them? Um, and then we finally, we also think that it's important that students feel that the classroom is a place where they belong and that they're supported in learning. Um, and so all of these contribute um, to, to um, this is the way that mindsets contribute to learning in the classroom. Um, so the third foundational component are knowledge and skills, um, which is the area I think that we in education tend to think, spend a lot of great deal of time of thinking about. Although here, um, we're not just thinking about knowledge and skills um, in the academic sense, we also think about the role of social skills and social knowledge or cultural knowledge or institutional knowledge and skills and how these play a big role um, in how kids are able to navigate different types of environments and understanding what the norms are and what they need to do to get there. Um, finally, um, the fourth foundational component is values. Um, so values is something that we really see underlying identity and playing a role in helping kids understand who they are and what they want to accomplish. You know, it's one of the things that really emerged as we were talking to people about success is this idea that you know, we don't want to be entirely agnostic about, or that we, but as individuals, we aren't entirely agnostic about what it actually means to be successful. Um, that part of determining that is understanding what matters to you, what you actually um, think is important um, in the larger world, and understand your connection to that. And so simply saying that, you know, success is neutral, we, people should actually need to engage in that question about what it means to them. Um, so these are the core foundations for young adult success, and so all of these kind of came together and how we think about what it means, what are, the, what are the underlying factors that really contribute to success that really allow um, kids to both um, be successful in the traditional realms of college and career, but also how they're engaging with their community and larger society. So I think the other Big, big question underneath is like, okay, so now we, so if you know what this looks like, how do we actually get there? And we spent a lot of time thinking about this. And I think one of the um, kind of interesting things um, about this is in many ways we went back to Dewey. Um, I mentioned how, um, you know, I mentioned how, um, you know, we kind of explore different realms of, you know, uh, neuroscience and psychology. And, you know, as we were thinking about this, and actually a scan of the literature in a lot of different ways led us back to Dewey, and we realized in many ways what we were trying to do was um, recreate experience in education. And so we're kind of like, well, why did we do this if that's actually something that was already known? But one of the things that has actually really changed are the developments that have gone on in neuroscience. And one of the most fascinating things about that is that in many ways, um, what we are finding with our with cutting edge technology actually reinforces a lot of these ideas that have been with us um, for over a hundred years, and that you know having experiences reinforces these neural connections. So there's this layer of what's going on inside of our brains at a neurological level as we experiencing things, 
is actually you know, what we've kind of known from an experiential standpoint and how we think, how we think about it versus actually what's happening um, neurologically in our brains. And these are actually one and the same. And so these ideas are not just, um, they're not just ideas. There's, there's actually a foundation for them um, within science. And so um, there's a lot that we actually do know now that we have much more um, scientific basis for than we did 100 years ago. Um, so one of the, way, the ways that we think about this is how um, children and youth need to have um, first opportunities to have um, varied experiences. So they need to be not just learning by hearing about things, but actually learning by doing. That it's this doing that really um, deepens knowledge and learning and understanding and incorporates it into what they know. Um, it's also not just important to do things, but to have these opportunities to really make meaning of what's happening. So if we just do things without processing it, it doesn't actually um, become a part of what we learn. Um, and finally, there's this core part about relationships, that relationships are sort of kind of the vehicle by which these things become really possible. Doing things in isolation doesn't have the same impact that it does when it's when um, kids are having experiences in the context of strong and supportive relationships. Um, so as you're thinking about this, we saw um, this idea of developmental experiences as having two big components, action and reflection. Um, and so we kind of have these different verbs that we sort of show up of what we actually mean um, by these types of actions and reflections. Um, so we kind of, we begin by thinking about the, about um, kids need to be encountering a wide different thing. So this is kind of just the baseline of exposure to different types of experiences, things that they haven't seen before. Um, we learn by novelty a lot of times, be, finding, seeing new things, being in new places, trying new things. Um, we also see an important role for this idea of tinkering. So, you know, it's not just doing something, but actually being able to ma manipulate it, trying different ways of doing something. Um, and then there's also this important part of choice. So, um, you know, we think about this a lot of times when, um, and the, what this means for choice varies by how, how old kids are. So, um, if you think about like, I don't know, young kids, you sort of say, um, you know, you have a choice. Do you want for dessert? Do you want cake or ice cream? And those are choices. But later on, it can become much more of, so if you want to have dessert, let's make this together. What do you want to make? And so there's a lot more possibilities um, of what that can become as kids get older. Um, there's also this important part of practice. Um, we don't get better at things by doing them once. It's really important that there's repeated experiences. And this is something, again, where like neuroscience really tells us that um, the neural connections get reinforced through repetition. And so we, we want to be not just um, exposing kids to something once. but So it's not like you, you learn archery by trying it one time and saying, yay, you've encountered archery, therefore you know archery. Not that we necessarily want to know our tree, but <laughs> as an opportunity. Um, and so, you know, you get better at it because you try it over and over again. Um, and then finally, um, and this is something that becomes particularly important as kids get older, is this role of contributing. That, you know, what they're doing is not just doing something over and over again, but actually being able to see how it has a value to something else, that they're contributing to something larger for themselves. And particularly for adolescents, um, this becomes important because they're trying to figure out who they are and they want to see where their place is in the larger world. Um, so the other half of this um, is, around, um, is around reflection. And so here, um, you know, we sort of see that we want to make sure that kids have these different types of experiences, but it's also really important um, that they have the chance to process what it is that they've done. Um, and this can be happening both afterwards as a reflection time, or it can also be um, as a way, as like during, um, while kids are actually doing something. So first, it's like describing what happened. 
um, saying so that it's actually not just something that happened, but actually putting a name to it, identifying the nature of that experience. Um, then it's about evaluating it. Um, what do I, you know, did I like that? Was that a positive experience for me? Um, making connections, saying how this how, how a particular experience is related to things that they've already done. Um, envisioning, thinking about how that might have gone differently or what they could do next time around. Um, and then finally, um, integrating. So really thinking about how this experience um, is a part of them and what, they, what it means to them. Um, so this kind of makes me think a lot about um, Abby Baird, who's a neuroscientist at Vassar. And she kind of talks about how um, adolescent girls, for example, sort of process an experience of like um, encountering a boy that they like. And so it's this idea like, okay, so like, you know, she'll, this girl will call up her friend and sort of say, so um, kind of describe it, like what happened? So I um, ran into, so I saw John in the hallway and he said hi to me. And then she kind of evaluates it. What do you think it means? Do you think he likes me? Does that go well? Um, and then she makes a connection. Well, yesterday, um, he, didn't, he saw me and he kind of looked at me, but he didn't say hi. So I'm not quite sure what's going on. Um, and then there's the idea of envisioning. So like, okay, so tomorrow, what should I do? Maybe I should say hi first, or maybe I should stop to talk to him. And then finally, it's kind of integrating. And so it, integrating what's happening in her. So, well, maybe John, um, Tim is somebody I actually want to, I'll actually get to know. And, you know, this is maybe how I should be approaching things. And so I think we naturally go about these process of thinking about things that happen to us and bring it into who we are. Um, the final big part about this um, is, is developmental relationships and how all of this um, is a part, are things that we experience and we can be reflecting on this, but it's all supported by the relationships that we have, that, that um, having these connections to other people really deepens what's going on um, within the different experiences that are going on. Okay, so I'm going to move on to um, so that's kind of how we go about develop. Sorry, how we go about developing all of this. Um, the third big piece of the story um, is thinking about what happens at different stages and really taking this developmental lens and making sure that we're understanding um, what's going on with kids as they're maturing and how we can actually tap into that. Um, so this is what was a big part of the project. I'm going to kind of give you a basically like three minute view of developmental psychology and development um, from early childhood into young adulthood, but just to kind of give you a picture about how we're thinking about this and how it relates um, to the idea of developmental experiences and how we can promote um, young adult success. Um, so first, um, in early childhood, I mean, there's, there's a lot going on. I mean, there's a huge amount of attention being paid to early childhood as being a key window for really um, mitigating some of the inequities we see um, later on of, of really thinking about um, what we can be doing to support young people. Um, and this is certainly true. Um, among the big things that are happening um, in early childhood is this process of learning self-regulation. So how do you self-soothe? How do you manage your emotions? It's a lot as you think about how we talk to um, three to five-year-olds is about helping them understand their behavior and coming up with, with strategies for really understanding, like what, helping kids really be able to do something about it so they, they can name what's happening to them and then know how to not be shouting or running up and down the, the aisles in the supermarket. Um, another big thing that's happening um, is around knowledge and skills, but this is on the social side. Um, at ages three to five is when kids really start to interact, having more opportunities to interact with kids, and they're learning some basic social rules and how do you actually um, be successful in these interactions. Um, as kids move into middle childhood, this is equivalent, this is ages six to 10. So it's when kids are moving um, into the elementary grades. Um, and so um, that's a huge shift. Um, you know, now we're moving into much more universal um, early childhood programs. So many times younger kids have had some interaction with a formalized institution 
but um, school at ages six is when it really becomes much more formalized. And this is also changes, um, changes in the structure of what our expectations are for kids. Um, and perhaps not surprisingly, this is also a time when um, kids' ability to self-regulate shows even more growth than it was in early childhood. There are a lot of things that we can actually ask a six-year-old to do, like sitting still for a longer time, which is much harder to ask of a three-year-old. Um, and then another thing that's happening is there's a tremendous growth um, cognitively for kids at this age, which is probably why instinctively, you know, historically, we sort of saw this as being an important part to bring kids um, into formalized schooling. Um, so this is also when kids are, are able to start to think metacognitively. They're starting to be aware of their own thinking and that process that's going on. So there's really a lot that's happening um, in middle childhood. Um, and then moving into early adolescence, which is ages um, 11 to 14. Um, this age corresponds to when kids are starting to move um, into middle school and the middle grades and puberty. So um, there's a lot, obviously another time where there's a lot happening that's going on. Um, so another thing that's really happening here um, is around identity. So kids are starting to think about who they are much more clearly, but this is also based on groups. If we think about how we are in junior high, it's not just so much about who I am, but what group I belong to. You know, am I a jock? Am I one of the brains? Am I one of the artsy people? This is really when kids start to think about who they are, not uh, in terms of their peers and different groupings within peers. Um, there's also a tremendous um, growth in thinking in mindsets as part of this identity development piece. Um, kids are starting to think about who they are and how they think about themselves. So one of the big um, things that also happens at this stage, which is particularly relevant um, for us as educators, is this, the beginning to really distinguish between ability and effort. And so this is also related to the idea of a growth mindset. So kids start to think like, am I good at something? Therefore, um, I'm a jock. Am I smart? Therefore, I am one of the brains in this school. Um, but what they start to do is they, they start to attribute what's going on quite often um, to ability as opposed to the fact that if I work hard, I too could be a brain. You know, it's something that um, is where, as they're trying to figure out who they are, um, they make this distinction. But a lot of times when we think about how we're reinforcing what's going on in the classroom, um, it becomes important to sort of say that the brains aren't just smart, aren't just brains because they're smart naturally, but it's also because they've worked hard to get there. And so that kids start to, as they start to self-identify, it's, it, they actually see their effort as also playing a good role. Or if you really want to become a jock, um, if you want to become Michael Jordan, you, you, it's not just because he's talented, but because he also worked really hard to get there. And seeing that this is a chance for you to not just take your identity as given, but work toward this identity of who you want to become. Um, and so another big stage is around middle adolescence, so as kids enter high school. Um, this is when the kids are really starting to try to figure out who they are in terms of um, individuals. And it's also when a lot of the idea of values comes into play, right? So like trying to figure out what's important to them, who do I want to become? There's a lot of questioning of, um, of themselves and the world and figuring out their place in there. So this is a really a time where we can actually tap into the struggle that um, middle adolescents have of trying to figure out um, who they are and their place in the world. Um, so I'm going to move into like just talking about some of the, I've thrown a lot at you. This is a long report, and I've given you the abbreviated version of this. Um, so and it, it, the longer report is in um, is available. We also have um, a two-page infographic, which kind of summarizes a lot of the key points I've talked about. So now I'm just going to kind of go through some of the what, what we sort of see as the big takeaways for this project. Um, so among them is this idea that you know development, it's happening everywhere, it's multifaceted and interconnected. So I think one of, the, one of the things that we tend to think about is that kids learn and develop when we decide that this is a learning and developing, that development opportunity. So like, you are learning because I am teaching you. When that's actually not quite true, right? Kids are constantly making meaning of what's going on. So when they enter a classroom, the lessons that they learn aren't just 
um, what their teacher is telling them. It's also like, okay, is this a place where I feel welcoming? Um, do I like the other kids in this room? Is this a good place to learn? Am I supported here? Um, does what we're learning actually matter to me? They're making judgments. They're making, they're thinking about what's happening and who they are as students and who they are as people. Um, so it's also tremendously important um, that youth have opportunities to have and reflect upon a wide range of experiences. It's not just about, um, you know, and it's, these are things that have to, be happening, have to be happening over and over again. And so it's taking people out of their, we learn by being taken out of our usual environments and being somewhere else, seeing something new. Um, we react to novelty and that's when we really start to have to make sense about what's happening to us. Um, another big takeaway is the importance of relationships. This is both with adults and peers. I didn't talk about the role of peers quite as much, but particularly um, as kids enter adolescence, they're obviously not just learning from adults. They're learning a lot from their friends and their classmates and the kids around them. Um, and so part of this is really making sure that we're, you know, as kids are learning from, from each other, that we're actually helping guide that, that we're really supporting that so it's not just a free-for-all. Um, and then finally for practice, we think a lot about the importance of intentionality um, and thinking about the role. And so, you know, that because kids are learning no matter where they are, um, and no matter when it is, and not just when we decide that it's a learning opportunity, um, we need to be much more intentional about how we're structuring um, the environments that they're in because they are um, taking it all in and deciding and making um, and thinking about it and, um, and internalizing a lot of what's happening. Um, it's also really important to be thinking about the role of development, how we want to be interacting with um, ten-year-olds is, it, it seems kind of obvious in some ways, but how we interact and how we teach ten-year-olds is going to be different than what's appropriate for 16-year-olds. Um, I think it's kind of an obvious thing, but I think it's something where we can actually be much more intentional in really saying, given where our, my kids are um, right now developmentally, what they're able to do, um, what they're struggling with in terms of I know, identity or um, how they're thinking about their social interactions. This can help us be more effective in engaging kids and, and helping them see what the larger relevance of what we're teaching them actually is. Um, so I'm also gonna talk a little bit about policy implications. I think um, one of the things I always feel when I talk about this is that there's this, like, wow, this is a lot to be taking in. So um, it's obviously not something that we can do as individuals in schools, but it's also thinking about what are the larger um, contextual parts of it that really matter. Um, so one of the things that, you know, right now, and if this seems to be shifting to some extent, so maybe we are at a great moment where we can change our attention, and Michelle mentioned this in, in her opening remarks, um, but a lot of how we think about things, about what, matter, what the purpose of school is around content knowledge and um, test-based accountability. Um, and it makes what I've just talked about hard, right? I mean, it's, this seems, it seems that these are potentially conflicting things. Um, but, you know, but I would argue that, you know, the key part of learning is actually about engagement and making sure that what we're doing matters to kids and ha giving them richer learning experiences. And some of these things may not be measured by tests, but tests are supposed to measure what kids know. And, um, and so these should be, these, you know, these can be reinforcing things. Um, it's also about allowing um, schools and other organizations to actually um, become learning organizations and for that to be safe. I mean, I think it's one of the tough things about accountability um, is that it makes us fearful. You know, there's something that we really have, we feel like we really need to focus on it because there are consequences if we don't, if we mess up. And it makes it hard to try something that we're not sure about. That, you know, if, if, we, if we don't do this right this time, maybe this will affect my kids' test scores. And that's a hard thing to actually do. So the extent to which we can say, you know, schools don't get better by just doing accountability. We also need to have schools figure out how to improve themselves. 
to actually take what we know how to do and get better at it because um, you know, adult, it's sort of the same process that we want for our kids. We want our schools to get better you know, by learning how to do something as new ideas come in, as common core state standards come into schools. We can't just automatically implement them. We need to learn how to do that. Um, and so it requires um, some space to actually try different things and figure out what works to sort of tinker and explore and practice and all these things I talked about and giving time to actually reflect on how a lesson went. Is this something we want to try again? These are all really, really important things that I talked about primarily in the context of kids, but apply equally to us as adults as we're trying to get better at our jobs and figuring out how we can actually be more effective um, in supporting young, supporting young people so that they become successful when they enter adulthood. Uh, I mentioned this early on in my talk, um, but this idea that um, thinking about the whole child is something that out of school has done well with. There's, I think there's other things that um, schools have done a lot better than out of school space. So there's a lot of learning that can happen in both ways. Um, because I think out of school time tends to be less structure, there's less clarity on what it means. But having this interaction, and it's also mirroring how kids are experiencing their world. So building up collaboration is something that can be tremendously helpful. Um, it's also, um, it's kind of something that's always around as we're talking about these things, but we know that resources are inequitably distribu distributed, you know, whether it's because of um, the communities that kids grow up in, what they have access to, um, how schools are resourced. This is a tremendous barrier, and you know we're not going to get there unless we do more around um, thinking about resources. So this is something I think that, from a policy level, really thinking about what it would take in terms of resources to get us to this place where we really are providing um, great experiences for our kids and really helping them grow so they have the ability to become um, successful when they become young adults. Um, so finally, because I'm a researcher, we always kind of like to conclude with like what we don't know. Um, there's a lot that we do know and there's a lot that we can do, but there's always like the next steps and what do we need to be thinking more about? Um, this idea of explicitly trying to help kids develop um, identity and agency is actually relatively new as concepts. These are old, but we've sort of have for a long time seen identity development and agency as just being things that happen. So um, getting back to the idea of intentionality, it's really understanding what sort of strategies actually help us do this. I think there are some things that um, have, um, have emerged over time, but to really start to consolidate this understanding is something that I think would benefit all of us. Um, Another part is that you know we know that kids are not having the sort of developmental experiences that they need. Um, that these that some kids just fall behind because for for various reasons. So when that happens, what can we do? Are there way, are there um, are there strategies and interventions that really can ameliorate some of these um, gaps that exist? Um, and finally, is it kind of this big part is this measurement idea. Um, you know, how do we actually measure them? How do we know whether or not these are happening? Um, I, you know, as a researcher, um, I believe in measurement. I think it's really important, but I think right now I also see the dangers around measurement with these things because it's a new field, and um, a lot of times as, um, as we start to measure things, we start to think about this in terms of accountability, and the measures just aren't there yet. You know, I think we've, we've, done a lot of measuring, but there's a certain type of precision and specificity and incentives around accountability that um, the measures just, we're not ready for that yet. But I think it's something we need to be thinking about. Um, another part of this too is what are we using this measurement for? Uh, you know, going back 20 plus years ago, we tended to think about measurement and education around inputs. You know, we thought about how much, what is per pupil spending and things like that. Um, and so that was how we were before. We moved to this new era of measurement where we're talking about outcomes. So we're saying, you know, what did we produce at the end of it? Um, and so that's where we are in the measurement world. I'd like to think that a lot of this idea of how we get to kids to be successful is actually about the process there. And I'd really like to think about measurement as not just saying, 
did we actually produce all the key factors that matter for young adult success, but how are we going about doing this? Seeing this as a much more formative thing where we are helping all of us understand how effective are we, what can we be doing better in terms of our practice as opposed to ultimately where kids end up. So those are the kind of the things that we don't, there's a lot of things that we don't know, but this is a tremendously exciting field and I'm really excited to see where this might go next. So thank you so much for taking the time to listen and coming here. So we have time for maybe one or two questions. Are there any questions about the report or about the presentation? Wonderful overview of uh, the future for children in America. I really appreciate it. It's very broad brush and very helpful. Um, I was intrigued with uh, comments near the end mm -hmm. about concerns about how we measure things. Mm -hmm. For example, there's been uh, statements recently about not measuring non-cognitive factors because it would have unintended consequences in terms of accountability, mm -hmm. and the measures aren't there yet, the point that you just made. And yet I'm struggling with how do we ensure that kids get what they need mm -hmm. without some sort of uh, accountability system. Um, accountability systems really have taken on a negative Mm -hmm. um, attribution at this point, and yet we need to ensure that children really are receiving what they need. So how do we navigate, any thoughts on how we navigate that tension? Thank you. Right, so yeah, I mean, I think, uh, yeah, I, I'm somebody that sounds like a very, very anti-accountability, I think from some of my remarks, and probably it sort of plays overstated, because I think accountability does play an important role, because I think it serves as a strong signal for what matters, and it also helps us understand what's happening. You know, it highlights what is important um, from you know from a leadership perspective, and so accountability plays a strong role. Um, I think the concern is more around it's you know part of it is you know narrowing what we're trying to do or misrepresenting what non-cognitive factors or you know SEL are supposed to be about. These are not meant to be. Um, these are not these are not just like endpoints of what we're trying to do. It's what kids are ultimately going to be able to do with them, and it's also um, I think there's also part of all of these different things which are very contextual. We also know that um, a lot of times um, I know like use one of our um, a really common um, concept right now, like you know grit and tenacity, is that you know, whether or not a kid is being gritty is not just about the fact that this is a gritty kid, but some, it has a lot to do with what, what they're actually being asked to do. Um, a kid who is tremendously gritty um, practicing their free throws may be, t may be not at all gritty when it comes to doing um, her algebra homework, for example. And it's not this inherent aspect of the grittiness, but it also has a lot to do um, with what the activity is or how supported. This also may be a girl who the previous year was tremendously gritty with her math homework because her teacher really supported her, made it clear what it was trying to do, it gave clearer direction. There's a lot of reasons why we display gritty behavior. And I think sometimes the worry I have is that a lot of times this is about more about what we are doing in the classroom than it is just about a kid and that this, that we are making judgments about kids that are not necessarily as precise. So I think the way I think measurement really should be is helping us understand the extent to which globally, that maybe not globally is the wrong word, but um, more within a classroom or within a school, are we actually doing these things to support kids toward these directions as opposed to sort of seeing where, you know, um, we've made great progress on grit because on average our kids move from a six to a 6.7 on the grit scale. I think that seems less helpful then providing feedback to teachers saying, you know, are we actually producing, are we actually, are we actually having the kinds of classrooms where kids are engaged in a way and they feel supported and they have clarity about what they're trying to do that they really display the gritty behaviors that we really want them to do and even giving them the strategies and the mindsets that they need to be behaving in these ways. I think 
can I, can I ask one quick question? Sorry. I can think I, we're, we're okay. at time. Thanks. So, Great, so thanks. we will, um, I will escort Jenny to the hallway um, so that you can um, ask her any further questions. Please download the report and thank you so much for your time this morning.